Let, let the record reflect. We have reconvened with all members present. As I ask you to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, I will ask you to remain standing for a moment of silence. standing. As we know, tragedy hit again in our country over this weekend. And I want a moment of silence and reflection for those that were senselessly, senselessly killed in Orlando, to their families who lost their loved ones, to a murderer and a terrorist fueled by hate and armed with a weapon that should never been out in the streets. Let's reflect on their lives and the hope that this will all be past us at some point. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome all. It's nice to have a nice full room for our um, business that will be taking place in about 45 minutes or so. <laughs> A couple of uh, <coughs> comments before we do a proclamation and uh, have some special uh, resolutions to pass. One, I want to thank our Council President, Ben Wolkowitz, for covering the meeting for me uh, three weeks ago while I was recovering from back surgery. I did catch you on Most TV. Welcome. You did an excellent job. Thank you. <laughs> That's subject to debate. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems like a long time ago, but... Uh, in between meetings, Memorial Day, we, was, we were challenged with forecasts that uh, was pretty dire for the morning, so we did <coughs> not have the parade, but had a very uh, respectful ceremony in the uh, rotunda downstairs, and uh, as, as always, our committee did a tremendous job making sure people knew what Memorial Day is all about, so I want to thank them and thank all the residents that came out for that. This past Saturday, we had the first annual Storytellers Workshop. And it was a tremendous success, showcasing what a great town we have, reminding all, as we ha have great art in Madison, but it reminded everyone that behind every piece of art, whether it's music, expression, or painting, is a story that needs to be told. And um, I, I got to tell some of my stories of growing up in a big family in Madison. That's part of the day, so it was lots of fun. And the um, festival would not have been possible without the hard work of a dedicated committee. This was conceived in January and happened in June, which is very impressive. Um, Dan Blank of We Grow Media was key, along with um, Barb Short of Short Stories Community Book Hub, putting it all together and getting a host of other volunteers to come up. Uh, Dan Cafaro of Atticus Review and Atticus Books, Deb Starker of the museum, Mel Tomaszewski, Melanie Tom Tomaszewski of the Madison Mud in Tivoli, uh, John Petrowski, Walter Rodriguez, the Writers' Theater of um, New Jersey, both John and Walter, their theater. Bonnie Monte, who uh, sat up there on the dais with me to discuss stories from the Shakespeare Theater. And it was an uh, army of volunteers and the DDC that supported it to make, make it all happen, along with the Chamber of Commerce, MACA, uh, and all the residents showed up. It was a great day. Uh, employees for the month of June, Jim Trimble of the Utilities Department, along with Magdalena, of the Water Electric Department for their commitment and dedication in keeping the utility department up to date in the absence of their supervisors who were out on medical leave. So they had to step up and keep things running. So I'm going to come down for a proclamation and a couple of resolutions. I'll swear I'm in. And for, we'll start with a proclamation for um, parent to, in support of parents who host Lose the Most to uh, bring out awareness. Chief, you want to come forward? Frank Ianarone, are you in the...
This, this is a special time of year with graduations happening from now until the, almost the end of June. A time of celebration, a time that people get together, but it's also a time that people make bad choices. And we read about it all the time and we say, how does that happen? And this is a proclamation to remind people that we can keep these things from happening. Whereas alcohol is a leading drug problem among young people, creating many health and safety risks, and whereas parents play a major role in their children's choices about alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, whereas underage use of alcohol is a serious problem that all too often leads to harmful consequences for youth and their families, and whereas parents who supply alcohol to their teens, friends, under any circumstances, even in their own homes, are breaking the law, and whereas parents knowingly who allow a person under 21 to remain in their home or on their property while consuming or possessing alcohol can be prosecuted. And whereas parents can be sued if they allow anyone under 21 to consume alcohol and they in turn hurt someone or damage property. And whereas our youth deserve to live and grow to adulthood in an environment where alcohol is not misused. Whereas MASA, Madison Alliance, Addressing substance abuse has partnered with Drug Free Action Alliance and parents who host Lose the Most Don't Be a Party to a Teenage Drinking to reinforce our community message that underage drinking is unsafe, unhealthy, and unacceptable. Now, therefore, I, Robert H. Conley, Mayor of Borough Madison, on behalf of the governing body, hereby proclaim support for parents who host Lose the Most and Don't Be a Party to Teenage Drinking Campaign to encourage parents, educators, businesses, community organizations, and others to learn more about the health and safety risks along with the potential legal ramifications associated with underage drinking. Chief and Frank, do you want to... Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm here myself, Frank Anna, with Terry Ziegler. We're from Massa, Ma, uh, Massa Madison Alliance addressing substance abuse. We have a, a small and growing active force. Uh, we run great local events in town, um, either discouraging purchasing of alcohol and or drugs for underage uh, people, and also how to do things without. We run open mic nights, things of that nature, um, to show people they can have a good time without drinking also. And um, it's a small volunteer force that's growing, and we're more, uh, more active all the time. And I just want to express our gratitude for Mayor Connolly and his proclamation and all of the cooperation that, you know, that we get with, from the Madison Police Department, the Madison High School, and the rest of the community members that come out to our events. We would really encourage anybody to come to any of the events that we hold periodically. You're all invited. <laughs> Hello, everyone. This is an important proclamation, especially this time of the year during prom season. Um, although parents are, um, host these parties have good intentions to keep their children safe, they are exposing themselves to huge civil and criminal liability. So it's best just to wait till your children are 21. Don't host these parties. Save yourself the, the, the headaches in the future. Like I said, there's great civil and criminal liability associated with these parties. Thank you, and thanks for all your work on behalf of the borough and keeping people safe. Uh, and I have a motion for the resolution R-177, resolution to the borough of Madison authorizing the appointment of police officer Paul J. Kozakowski as sergeant in the Madison Police Force <clears throat> Police Department, effective June 14th, 2016. I'll move it. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Carmelo Vitale, can you, as okay. chair to public safety, please come and join me, chief.
<laughs> While we're getting situated here, I want to uh, thank Lieutenant Joe Longo for giving me a little bios on each of our uh, officers today. So just a quick little bio on Paul right before we swear him in. Born and raised in Madison, third generation Madison police officer, graduate of Seton Hall Prep, and you started your career with Madison Police Department in 1995 after graduating from Morris County Police Academy. You're a graduate of um, Marist College with a degree in history, and you will be in charge of the Detective Bureau. Raise your right hand, left hand of the Bible, and repeat after me. I state your name. I, Paul Kozakowski. You solemnly swear. You solemnly swear. And I will faithfully. And I will faithfully. Impartially. Impartially. And justly perform. And justly perform. All the duties of. All the duties of. Sergeant in the Madison Police Department. Sergeant in the Madison Police Department. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. I further solemnly swear. I further solemnly swear. I will support the Constitution of the United States. I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. The Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And to the government's established United States. And the government's established in the United States. And in this state. And in this state. And the authority of the people. And the authority of the people. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations, Sergeant. <laughs> for you for the Rose City. No, no rose for you, sorry. And if I can have a motion for resolution 178-2016, resolution of the Borough of Madison authorizing the appointment of police officer Ed, Edward Michko Jr. as sergeant in the Madison Police Department effective June 14th, 2016. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Please come forward. Joanne. Danny. Just a little background on soon-to-be Sergeant Ed. Born and raised in the town of Booton. We won't hold that against you. <laughs> and now a current, current resident of Florham Park, which is a suburb of Madison. Ed joined the Madison Police Department in 1995 after attending Morris County 45th Basic Police Training Academy as an alternate route program cadet. Graduated second in his class of 49 other recruits. Graduated from Morris County College with an associate, associate's degree in criminal justice and business administration. And Sergeant Ed will be assigned to the patrol division. Okay, hold the Bible. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your name. I Edward Jr. You solemnly swear. You solemnly swear. I will faithfully. Partially. Partially. And justly perform. Justly perform. All the duties of. All the duties of. Sergeant of the Madison Police Department. Sergeant of the Madison Police Department. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. 
I further solemnly swear. I further solemnly swear. I support the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. The Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And to the governments established in the United States. To the governments established in the United States. And in this state. And in this state. On the authority of people. On the authority of people. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations, Sergeant. Signature on the oath. May I have a motion for a resolution 179-2016 resolution of the Borough of Madison authorizing the appointment of Police Officer Lisa Esposito as Sergeant in the Madison Police Department effective June 14, 2016. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Lisa Esposito, please come forward. A little bit about Lisa before we start this. Lisa has a significant other, Sean McCarthy, a current officer with the department who is presently deployed in Africa with the United States Navy. So he could not be with us in this big occasion. Lisa has two children, Nicholas, age 14, Peter, age 11. And Peter is playing in the Little League right now. So we're, thankfully, we've got it covered by the camera. So we'll, we'll play it back for him. Lisa comes from a long line of law enforcement officers, brother Mark right here, is a lieutenant in Morris County Pol uh, Sheriff's Office. Grandfather Joseph Shalonzo was chief of Madison Auxiliary Police, and her father, Peter Shalonzo, was a special officer with Madison Police. Lisa began her career with the department in 1995 after graduating from M the Morris County uh, Police Academy, a graduate of Parsippany Hills High School. Lisa's bachelor degree is from College of St. Elizabeth and master degree in Public Administration from Kane University, my alma mater. And Lisa will be assigned to patrol division. And especially significant is Lisa is our first woman sergeant in the police department. Historic moment. <laughs> Raise your right hand, left hand of the Bible, and repeat after me. I state your name. I, Lisa Esposito. You solemnly swear. You solemnly swear. That I will faithfully. That I will faithfully. Impartially. Impartially. And justly perform. And justly perform. All the duties of. All the duties of. Sergeant in the Madison Police Department. Sergeant in the Madison Police Department. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. I further solemnly swear. I further solemnly swear. I will support the Constitution of the United States. I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And to the governments established in the United States. And to the governments established in the United States. And in, and in this state. And in this state. Under the authority of the people. Under the authority of the people. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you.
Now this is when we shift into the gears for to uh, re reports from committees, and so if uh, any, I know everyone wants to stay, but in case you have other obligations, <laughs> if you want to leave, you can do so right now. We'll take a few seconds, but just remind everyone this this is a great time to celebrate. But we have to keep the doors open, so keep the uh, celebrations quiet and uh, out in the uh, rotunda area. We're going downstairs. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations, it's quite an honor. First woman, very exciting. Thank you for those that are still in the audience. A few bodies. <laughs> what a committee. All right, we'll uh, try to do the uh, reports from Committees, speak up, speak loudly. <laughs> Utilities, Mr. Wolkowitz. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> I'll do the best I can under the circumstances. Uh, the electric department had installed a new pole on Danforth Road, which was unfortunately uh, had to be done because of a car pole accident. Never a happy thing. We began the annual substation testing. We began annual line clearance, continued new construction of a primary feeder on Britain Street. There were several street lights that were repaired, service upgrades, and some removal, and there were markout requests that were satisfied. I don't um, have a report from the Water Department, but I do have a couple of other things to mention on the finance side of utility operations. One is that Currently, 184 families and or individuals have taken advantage of the electric utility rebate. And uh, that's running well ahead of last year. Last year for the entire year, I, I don't recall the exact number, but I believe it was in the mid-250s. So we're running well ahead of that. And indeed, the summer tends to be a time when many people look for a rebate simply because their bills have gotten higher. Um, also this evening we're going to hear about two projects that will uh, dramatically change our utilities. One has to do with billing, automated meters. Uh, basically now we 
collect data on usage of our utilities by having people go around uh, literally with pencil and pad and write down the readings, there are much more sophisticated ways to do that that have many benefits. And you'll hear more about that later on in the meeting. And the other one is self-generation. We're now in the process of mapping out a way that the borough would be able to actually create its own power and not have to buy all of it as it does now. So I think you'll find both of those quite interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Health, Mr. Catanello. Uh, unfortunately, my iPad has gone the way of the dinosaur. Ooh. So uh, I don't have a hard copy of, uh, of the health report, so I have nothing today. Okay. Finance and Borough Clerk, Mr. Landrigan. Thank you, Mayor. Nislavaccia completed their audit. The Borough's Audit Committee reviewed the document with the auditors and supported their recommendations. Administration and the finance team did an excellent job pulling together all the financial <laughs> reports this year. They are focused on making improvements this year, which include improving utility billing daily closeout process, changing the revenue posting procedures, and refin refining the tax collector's state tax sale process. The finance department has been working with utility billing and meter vendors to make sure the proposed automated meters communicate with the handheld units and billing software. In addition, the finance department has several larger long-term projects it is working on, which include the capital and operating budget process. Believe it or not, the department heads will start working on their 2017 budget shortly, and the finance department is working on a number of improvements to the process. Software, cross-training the staff, and taking full advantage of all capabilities in the finance software that is used throughout the borough. In regards to generation, which uh, Council President Walkwoods mentioned, we will hear about the possibility of having generation here in the borough later this evening. This is a very complex project but one that could yield significant benefits to the borough of Madison. And the CFO is also getting a crash course on the various software packages that the finance department uses. Who says you can't teach an old dog new tricks? Now, Jim, are you that old? I figured that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> From the payroll department, two employees received step increases this month. 14 summer interns have started working in various departments. Two new police officers and a new court clerk started working in this past pay period as well. And from the tax collectors, letters will be going out soon to anyone with outstanding 2015 tax and utility payments. The tax sale is scheduled for September 14th, and the borough will publish the list of delinquent properties in August. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Public Safety, Ms. Vitale. Thank you, Mayor. On May 23rd, 2016, uh, Acting Lieutenant John Misha was promoted to the rank of lieutenant and will take command of the patrol division. Also promoted to the rank of lieutenant was Sergeant Joseph Longo, who will command the support services division. On May 26, Patrolman Travis Daniel and Patrolman Ryan Dunn graduated from the Morris County Police Academy. Patrolman Dunn was awarded the Top Gun Award for the highest average in firearms training and a third place award in physical fitness. Patrolman Adam Riley has completed his field training and PDC certifications and has assumed solo patrol within the patrol division. On May 24th, the Madison Police Department hosts a case law training in their EOC um, department, which afforded a low-cost training for numerous um, Madison officers. Recently hired per diem <coughs> dispatchers were Joseph Montagna, and Edward Gibney started their training in the communications division. Once fully trained, they will be added to the pool of per diem dispatchers who will reduce overtime costs within the division. From the fire department. During the month of May, the fire department responded to 91 calls. There were uh, 12 general alarms, 15 still alarms, 16 investigations, 48 EMS calls. Two, two department drills were conducted. Two firefighters completed a three-day incident management class at the Morris County Fire Academy. The Fire Prevention Bureau conducted 74 uh, inspections. 60 of them were primary, nine re-inspections, 
five, safe housing and other inspections. 34, smoke detector CO inspections for resale or rentals were conducted. The required annual testing was completed for the following. 2,850 2, feet of five inch large diameter hose was tested and all passed. The department's three 1,250 1, 1, GPM pumpers were tested and all they, they all passed. 227 feet of ground ladders were tested and all passed. Um, on Wednesday evening, last evening, um, uh, Councilwoman Ostry Bailey and myself um, uh, went with um, Chief DeRosa to receive a, a, a plaque from Morse County Historical, Historical Society, yeah, Historic, Historic Preservation, Preservation Committee, yeah, um, that, which gave a seventy-five thousand um, dollars for um, you know towards the the purchase of Geraldine. Uh, it was a very nice uh, occasion. Uh, Ray Chang gave um, Chief DeRosa a beautiful, huge plaque. So I, I don't know if it'll last very much on Geraldine. It looked bigger than Geraldine, but uh, we'll see about that. But it was a very nice occasion. So we thank the freeholders for uh, hosting us, and uh, it, it was very interesting, very nice. Um, I'd like to report a little bit about the Joint Court. Um, the Joint Court welcomed its newest member, Brianna Diamond, on June 6th. Brianna replaced Teresa Rizzo, who left to accept the position with Morris Township. Um, I wanted to give um, everyone a, a thought about what goes on with our shared services. So um, the caseload through May 2016 is down somewhat from the same period last year. But of course, we still have a lot of um, uh, 2016 left. So, uh, so far in 2016, we have 6,939 cases that they've heard down here. Um, the revenues generated um, from all of that in 2016 so far is $276,814. Um, the revenues generated per municipality uh, Chatham Borough received 46476 Chatham Township 24331 Harding Township 22650 Madison Borough 69000 uh, Morris Township 114348 um, The Joint Court continues to, um, to function very efficiently at its current staffing level of three full-time and one part-time employee. Uh, the savings per municipality uh, for the, since the joint court's inception was directly related to a staffing level. Uh, in Chatham uh, Borough, they had one court administrator and one part-time deputy. In Chatham Township, there was one court administrator and one part-time uh, deputy. In Harding Township, uh, one court administrator and one part-time deputy. In Morris Township, there was one court administrator, two full deputies, three personnel. In addition, we now function with one judge instead of four, three prosecutors instead of four, two public defenders instead of four. So they're doing um, a, a really uh, wonderful job, and it's, uh, it's, it's a great way uh, for the people of Madison to know uh, about our shared services with other communities. That's all, Mayor. Thank you. Media Affairs, Ms. Bailey. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, regarding the DDC, Farmer's Market is open every Thursday, 2 to 7 p.m. It's bigger than ever. Please visit and shop locally. From the Madison Senior Center, the Summer Seminar Series begins its 31st season on Thursday, July 7th. It's co-sponsored by the, uh, the Friends of the Madison Senior Center and the Friends of the Madison Public Library. The programs are held in the Chase Room of the Library and are free of charge. And this brochure um, is available at either the Senior Center or at the library and tells you exactly what's going on in every um, seminar. And after a few years' absence, um, the Friends of the Madison Senior Center are planning a return to Bottle Hill Day with a new marketing approach. They're going to have graphics, giveaways, promotional materials, and, and which will help publicize the many activities at the center 
and highlight the financial support the group provides every year. They will again fund landscaping by a local company for a garden areas that overlook the parking lot. While the Tri-Town 55-plus Community Forum was not well attended uh, June 7th, because I guess a lot of things were happening that day, participants did uh, look at the top areas of concern and identified them as transportation, housing, walkability, and communication. And they gave thoughtful suggestions to possibly re uh, remedy, so I think we will hear more from um, the Health Department and the Senior uh, Center on that. And then from recreation, in 2016, um, the uh, recreation director, Zach Ellis, has collected $25,260 in field rentals. His projection is by the end of the summer, he will uh, have collected a total of $30,000. The recre recreation department is now serving 28 groups across 15 fields this season. Also, the lights at the Madison Recreation Center are being properly maintained and used. When the fields are not used, the lights are turned off early, resulting in savings of $11,794 since the fields opened. Madison Chamber of Commerce, Tuesday, June 14th, uh, 12 p.m. to 4 p.m., corner of Central Avenue and Main Street. Bring your fire extinguisher for to be inspected. This is provided by the Firefighters Equipment Company. It's $15 per inspection. All merchants and residents are welcome. And that's it, Mayor. Thank you. In Public Works and Engineering, Mr. Rowe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first, from the road, uh, Engineering for the Roads Department, Cefeli and Sons Construction have been working on the 2016 road improvement project since the first week of May. They have completed drainage and curbing work at Lawanica and Crescent and are now working on Kinney and West. Uh, subcontractor Revix Construction has finished the water use work on West, Kinney, and Cottage Place. Additional cross uh, street water main improvements have been recommended based upon excavations and, in and inspections completed at Cottage Place. We can compl anticipate completion of all work in July. Uh, second, downtown paver materials uh, from Hanover expected later this week. Uh, paver reset and planner reconstruction work has been complicated by state historic preservation uh, office uh, letter requiring a prior approval uh, and review process. A meeting was held with the Shade Tree Management Board on tree wells and construction techniques to minimize root damage. And finally, uh, public service, electric and gas repaved uh, Fairview Ave over the past two weeks. Uh, the borough has completed the restriping work on Fairview while also completing the balance of the mill and overlay striping work. And earlier this evening, there was a meeting to review the community with the community to review the design for Prospect Street reconstruction. And I believe that went uh, fairly well. Uh, for sewers, our sewer consultant, Kleinfelder, has indicated that plans and specs for both the North Street pump station and sewer main evaluation repair will be ready for review and bidding later this week. <coughs> and from parks, uh, later this week there will be a pre-construction meeting to review the Danforth Road Sports Field site remediation project with Voller Construction. We anticipate starting that project in July. And our contractor uh, working at the skating rink has performed additional aeration and seeding. Uh, so the new playing surfaces can be fully established by this fall. That's everything. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Any communications petitions? Uh, none received, Mayor. Okay, this is our first of two invitations for discussion. This one is limited to items on the agenda, and they, they include uh, zoning amendments for Geralda Farms. Number two is Pomeroy Woods uh, conservation easement, and three is self-generation utility meters. And number four is request for proposals for energy audits. And you also may comment or ask questions on any of the resolutions. Uh, later in the meeting, we'll have uh, opportunity to comment on anything. And there's also the time for uh, ordinances with hearings for the, to comment on those. So anyone wishing to comment on agenda items, please step forward. Seeing none, close this part of the meeting. Zoning amendments for Geralda Farms. Osri. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so the Planning Board in 2014 adopted a land use element amendment to the master plan that refines the land use policies guiding future development and reuse of sites at Geralda Farms. It's really just kind of tweaking what was put in place many years ago. And so in your packet are the, um, is the proposed land use ordinance that implements what was suggested in the amendment to the master plan. And I assume everybody's read it. Any questions? Any questions on this? 
is uh, Ordinance 49 that is listed for introduction. Mm. So this will be uh, introduced. We'll go back to the um, planning board, and then we'll be back for final hearing. All right. Well done. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Pomeroy Woods, Library Conservation Easement, and you're up again. Okay. Um, so uh, behind the library is some woods, and there's a stream, and the Open Space Committee looks at the map periodically to see uh, what is on the Rossi, which is the recreation open space inventory. Um, is there any place that we need to preserve? And this piece of property came up. It's directly behind the library. It provides uh, protection for the neighborhood and um, it creates open space buffers, uh, buffers as well as water stabilization. So we think that that piece of property should be preserved with a conservation easement uh, by the borough and um, for the town of Madison. Um, it's just a positive thing. Yes. I, I realize it's referred to as Pomeroy Woods, but does it go all the way up to Pomeroy? Yes. It, it, it's, it, okay. it's just the woods directly behind the library. We're not talking about yes. the grass and areas, parking lot. Every, all of that is, okay. will be government. So. Thank you. Bob? Yeah, I'm very familiar with it, and it's a beautiful piece of property. There is a stream that does run through it, and I remember during, I think it was Hurricane Irene, that f overflowed and flooded the library. Is there any thought to maybe working with that to prevent that from happening again? They, they have been working on it periodically Good. through the years. Um, also, the uh, Parks Committee uh, would be interested in starting to place more trees in there, which would even create better stabilization. There are a lot of down trees from the last hurricane. They weren't removed. I'm not sure what we do about that. That's good. Thank you. That's good. Pat, did you have your? No. In, in a way, it's kind of like two areas. You've got the, the stream area, which in events like Irene and others becomes a very wide thing because it's carrying quite a bit of the water off the hill. And then you have what has been created through an Eagle Scout project, the path, actually Eagle Scout project and help of Sandy the, the path that leads from Pomeroy down to the uh, library, which is a nice way to get uh, people from walking in, in a nice environment. So I, no, and the path is used a lot. Yep. I mean, it's really interesting how people use the path. But we need to get those dead tree limbs out of there and put new trees in. Anyway, so this is what we're proposing to do. Okay, we're all moving forward. Hey, self-generation. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Let's think while I get the technology going. Talk briefly about uh, two important projects. Um, one that we are ready to implement. Thank you. Um, first is. Uh, There we go. First is the uh, automated meter uh, project. We talked a little bit about this. I'm just going to sum it up real quickly. We're looking to replace the paper and pencil with electric handheld devices. Had multiple meetings with um, particular vendors. Had a consultant come in and give us guidance on which were the best. Um, Michael Piano, myself, Tom uh, DiBias, and uh, meter readers, and Donna, and others from Utility Building all got together. We wanted to make sure that we had a system that we bought now that would be scalable when we went to full uh, automated meter reading. Um, we're looking to start to replace both water and electric meters and test this system, make sure we're comfortable with it, that it works right. Um, one of the other goals is to collect 15-minute interval data on our 50 to 100 largest customers. That interval consumption data is uh, going to be very valuable to us down the road if we were to ever do uh, time of use um, consumption for our largest customers. Um, we wanted to identify, as I said before, a system that was easily to convert over, and uh, we reviewed a number of providers and then a de determined l to be the best system for our needs. So the purchase would um, involve actually two different companies that we're buying from because this is the way we have to do it. We cannot buy Elster meters directly from Elster. They have a distribution um, relationship. And we'd be buying approximately 180 electric meters 
These are regular electric meters that you can use, but they also happen to be integrate with a handheld device, and they also happen to be meters that can ultimately become uh, meters that can use a different communication platform that would make the system fully automated and no longer have to have a handheld device. You get 50 water modules, um, which are placed on our existing network <coughs> meters, which are the ones that Tom likes. We wanted to make sure that these modules worked. Um, it's a module wall mounting cut and wire cable. Um, basically means that you would not have to go inside the house anymore. There are other technologies that allow that, but this is, um, this is one that would ultimately also be able to merge into the fully automated system. Um, in addition, we would be purchasing fr directly from the company three handheld units. You've probably seen them before. Um, collection units that have GPS capability, two optical cables, though those optical cables will allow us to take a laptop out to our 50 top customers and download that interval data. Once we went fully automated, that would all come back to us automatically, but for the moment with the handheld, we would go and download that information about once every four or five months. So it's not that, not that terrible. The meters hold a lot of data. Um, there's a manager software called Route Manager Software, which integrates and connects our billing software to the handheld devices and allows the information to flow back and forth. Training support and integration. Each purchase would be a little under um, $40,000, so it's under the bid threshold. Um, so our next step would be to uh, finalize and place the order, install, train, implement, evaluate the system, and then report back to you. One quick question. You said you were buying... I think 180 meters, but you said we're only putting them on the 50 to 100 largest customers? No, we're actually going to, like, say the three houses that are being built on Green, Green Village okay. Road. Michael needs meters. We might as well buy these meters. So they'll okay. be starting to be installed okay. through other parts of town on regular residential. Are we installing these on ourselves? Because we're one of the 50 or 100 largest customers. Matt, the Borough of Madison, our wells, some of our buildings fall into that top 50 customer list. Yes. Are we just doing these on commercial establishments? No, we would do it on commercial establishments and on our own meters. We okay. want to see our own consumption on a 15-minute increment basis. Thank you. Okay. So it's taken a long time, but I think we're there. So, yeah. This is a long time coming. And uh, another project that's long time coming, and it's going to take a little while longer, but this is the very first um, kind of large presentation I wanted to give to you on self-generation. So what does that mean? That means... The possibility of Madison having actual electric generation units in town that would supp could supply the town with a portion of electricity. Um, we have done a lot of um, looking at this. There's generation units down in Seaside Heights. We went and visited there. We went and visited Sussex Rural, which has both automated metering and, and generation units. Um, we've uh, consulted with um, another consultant, Paul Williams. I've looked at this for a couple of years. What uh, was a concern was how do we justify buying a $10 million piece of equipment when we've never really run anything like this before. Uh, what's interesting is um, when we were talking to our friends down in Vineland, they said, well, you know, we did a, a different situation. We did a power purchase arrangement where we told someone, come on and build the generation here, and we'll just buy the electricity from you. And uh, that was for solar, so a different type of generation, but this is still applicable from a legal standpoint. So we started looking into it and talking to potential developers, and it looks like we've got a potential um, financial structure that we want to look into more. And the next step would be um, to refine it and then issue an RFP and really see are, are developers interested in giving this structure to us. So I, I want to give you an overview of this what potentially we could receive when we issue RFPs, and then hopefully in the end I'd like your um, consensus to yeah, go out and, and work on an RFP that purchasing law and administration say is, is viable and then, then go to market with it and, and see what we get. Mm -hmm. So um, we'd be looking to have an 8 megawatt to maximum 9.9 .9 megawatt natural gas-fired electric generation units located at the DPW yard secured behind the fence. Um, Location to be determined, but we've looked at the gas lines, we've looked at all the in, in necessary infrastructure, the ability to connect to our current grid. Um, we don't have to go back to the substation. We can connect right to primary lines on John Avenue. Um, the project would be designed, built, paid for, operated, and maintained by a third party. So that's different than the Seaside model. Seaside 
to you know go out on their own and build build units on their own, some bumps and some starts. But in this instance, it's we're looking at a potential lower risk model where someone else designs, builds, pays for, operates, and maintains. Um, the borough would contract with the vendor for um, a term not to exceed 15 years. The borough would receive guaranteed financial benefits. Um, and savings per the contract, and we would have the right but not obligation to buy these units at the end of the term. Um, the electric generation, um, the benefits of having are, are threefold. There's a financial benefit, and I'll go into some of these in more detail. There's a financial benefit of being able to save uh, on peak shaving. We turn it on on the hottest days of the year, and we're able to uh, reduce the borough's costs. I'll go into more detail there. Um, also, transmission. We pay to have electricity transmitted to us. There's like highways, if you will, and we pay a toll for that electricity to get to our substation. We can reduce that cost. Second is a hedge. And uh, having these units here will not only give us the financial benefit, but they protect us from what we anticipate are future increases in those two major costs. And then the third is reliability. And we talked about this at the Utility Advisory Committee, and I, I don't want to play up the reliability issue, but it is something that we could benefit from. My, the way it would work is, let's say our entire feeder line is down. Michael's crew would come out create what we'll call an island where there's only certain circuits that would be fed by this unit and that all the other units they could continue to work on, they would not be energized. Michael would turn on the generation and we could power up the entire downtown um, and certain other parts of town with these units. So if we had a long-term outage, we're not talking a two-hour outage, we're not talking a four-hour outage, um, this could happen. We're also not talking about that traditional switching gear that you think of when you have a generator or a house where it just kind of automatically goes on. This would be a manual process, and talking to Michael, he wants to keep it manual and be able to fully control it um, on his own. So there is a benefit to that. These happen to be, oh, I should have flipped to the next slide, I apologize. Um, so those are the three points I talked about, and that happens to be an image of the three um, generators that are at Seaside Heights right now. What's interesting about the reliability in Seaside Heights is they put diesel units in, they put them in six months before Hurricane Sandy, and by luck they chose diesel, by luck they got them in before Sandy. They lost their power line, they lost their natural gas line, and um, they got approval from the state police to have diesel trucks go over the causeway, turn these units on, and they did exactly what I talked about. They created an island, they were able to power up their municipal building, a hotel where first responders stayed at, and their um, municipal offices and, and fire and other, other facilities. I think uh, there's an image on the internet that shows the entire Jersey Shore completely dark the night after Hurricane Sandy, or Superstorm Sandy, except some lights at Seaside Heights because they had the ability to do their own generation. So um, the project process, we'll go through that and then I'll go into the economic drivers. The borough would issue an RFP to solicit proposals. Um, uh, we won't specify the exact size or contract structure and we would evaluate it based on the life cycle savings. Um, we would then review and present the findings of this RFP to council. Um, if approved um, that, yes, this looks like a, a viable deal, we would move uh, forward in a process of negotiation. We'd notify the neighbors and talk to them and say, hey, we're looking to do this. Um, the units at Seaside Heights and the units we would bid would be um, have sound attenuation, so they'd be very quiet. I'd say, uh, I don't want to tease Mike, Mike Giordano, but probably quieter than Jimmy Sedano standing out there in the middle of the yard. Um, I think these units would be that so the neighbors um, wouldn't necessarily uh, hear much of anything. Um, we'd have to do a detailed legal review. We've done a cursory legal review, and I'll give you that legal, confidential legal opinion that uh, our attorney says so far so good. Um, we'd negotiate with the developer, similar to the way we did with GVR. We'd negotiate with the developers, come up with acceptable terms. Then we'd come back for council approval, execute the contracts, and go down the road from there. So I want to touch more on the economic drivers because this is really the main reason for doing this um, is the economics. Um, the borough is connected to the grid. People know it as PJM. They operate the largest uh, electric control area uh, in the world. Um, there are various savings and revenues that this unit will generate, and we will share in those. Um, uh, there's transmission capacity, spot market prices, and, and others that make up the total cost of electricity. There's revenues that we actually could be earning from the grid. They would pay us to have a unit like this that could be dispatched. And the contract would um, guarantee, we believe we can get a contract that would guarantee savings to the borough. We anticipate through financial modeling that the units could generate up to 1.4 million a year. So just in short summary, 10 plus million to install these units, 
1.4 million in um, annual benefits, we think we can get up to $400,000 a year in benefits um, annually out of it. The developer would receive the other funds. So um, if there was a polar vortex, though, like we had in the past, those savings that we could get would be, could be significantly more. Um, at absolutely no cost, we would get the benefit of that, $200,000, $400,000 a year. This is just a chart on what we think the, uh, what was the current capacity costs um, and I'll just leave it that if you go online <coughs> net and just type in um, capacity costs, you'll come up to a web page that explains how we get charged on that. I'll show it to you in a bill in a minute, but I don't want to go through the mathematics of it, but it is a significant charge that we receive, and it's driven by this number, which is created through um, an auction process through PJM. So to go into more detail on the savings, um, I just mentioned the capacity costs. Um, if you run the generator on the five, six, seven, eight, nine hottest days of the year, we're going to hit the five peak non-coincident days that determine our capacity cost. We pay over $2 million, um, and in years have paid over $3 million in the capacity cost to the grid, um, and we think we can save 20%. So that would generate, of that $1.4 million I mentioned, that just generates about 400000 a year. So what does that mean, that $2 million? Why is Madison paying so much money for this? You've heard it in the past. I'll just reiterate it again. We're paying for people to have generation, generating units that are there that only get turned on the 5, 6, 10, 20 hottest days of the year. You can't store electricity. You can store natural gas. You can store water. You can store other things. You can't store electricity. When the grid needs more energy, they're actually not necessarily picking up the phone, but they're contacting people and saying, turn on the generation, we need more capacity. So we pay for people to sit there and have these units available. Transmission payments, that's also priced, and our cost of about 680000 a year is driven by the four or five, the hottest days of the year. So we could save 20% of 680000 or $130,000. And when I say we, that's the generator would, would generate those savings. Um, there's also reduced cost by what we would purchase on the spot market. There are times when this unit could generate electricity and we would be able to buy it and, and, um, and use it at $80 a megawatt. And there's times when the spot market goes up to 100 200 300 during the polar vortex, $1,000. So there's savings there for that. Um, this just happens to show a chart um, of a use for our daily service to help us track peak days, just so you know that we're always looking at it. Um, and there's companies out there that will help us determine um, when those peak days are. This is very small print. I'll give anybody a copy if you want to, our four-page PJM invoice, which is $306,000, of which this is uh, about $75,000 in transmission costs, these first two lines. Network integration, transmission service, and transmission enhancement. That's what we pay for JCPNL to let their, our electricity travel through their, on their highway to get to our substations. And then this big number here, $223,000 in capacity charge every month. $200,000 to $300,000 in the capacity charge on that invoice. So you can see of a $306,000 bill for PJM, this isn't our block energy, this is the PJM services, 290 thousand dollars of it is both transmission and um, the capacity. So there's some serious um, costs associated um, with those two factors, and, and the generation unit would help us on that. Jim, on those charges, they're all related to the amount of electricity that gets moved to Madison? Correct. And are they variable depending on how expensive electricity is? I mean, does the transmission cost go up per megawatt so JC, at certain times? It, uh, no, it's a fixed fee. They will set the price just like they do on capacity. Pick a day, divide up our costs amongst the entire grid. And so on the hottest day of the year, they're going to say how much electricity went to Madison, therefore how much are they going to be charged. And that goes to JCPNL. We're in one of the lowest transmission cost zones right now. PSEG, our, our friends up in Park Ridge, pay almost as much in transmission as they do in capacity. So we're paying 200000 in uh, uh, every month on capacity and only seventy five in transmission. They might be paying 200 and 200 again. So the possibility of the cost going up is great, but it is based on one day 
one actual hour that is not predetermined is kind of when they say was the hottest, busiest day. And if we're running our generator during that time, we're going to knock our price down by 20%. And 10 megawatts is what percentage of our use, or of our, what we use on a, the hottest day of the year? Good question. Um, 25%. Peak out at about 40 megawatts. <coughs> So we talked a little bit about the hedge. I don't want to get into it too much except that these charges are not going away capacity and transmission. And having this generation unit in here kind of protects us from any upward movement in these prices um, and protects us from an exposure. So I, I kind of use that as a secondary financial benefit. So there are a couple of revenues that this is page 15. There are a couple of revenues that we can also generate by having this unit here. One is called the synchronized reserve market. The grid, PJM, will pay companies if you have a generator that you can turn on very quickly. They might be in a situation where, oh, geez, you know, that one major generation unit went offline and it's going to take us a half an hour to get another one online. Dispatch as much sync reserve as we can. It's only dispatched for 15 minutes to a half an hour. The unit gets turned on remotely by the company that manages it. And if we... Um, participate in that market and are just ready when PJM needs us, just sitting there ready, and are willing to turn that on, they'll pay $300,000 a year or more just to have the unit ready. Will it get dispatched? Yes. It won't get dispatched a whole lot, though. 15 minutes here, 15 minutes there. And then um, finally, there is um, a load response or curtailment, and PJM pays customers to reduce load. And we're not only a generator, but in this instance, we're actually a, a user, a load entity. And we could, we believe legally, we could collect by saying we're turning the generation unit on and reducing our load. <clears throat> They'll pay us for sync reserve when they need a quick hit. They'll pay us for um, load response when the capacity, um, when the system is stressed. And um, you'll, you'll hear, I think, um, actually, uh, in the past, Chris Manick over at the joint meeting has been involved in, in being able to dispatch. And he'll say, I can turn off my electricity and turn on my generators here that run on the methane. We get, um, demand resp uh, we get a load response or curtailment payment from PJM for doing that. And that can be $250,000 a year. So you add all those financial benefits up, that comes to about $1.4 million. We divide that up between ourselves and the developer in, in a contractual agreement. So um, there are certain market risks um, with this. Um, there's the risk that um, maybe the rates of PJM decrease. Maybe the capacity and transmission costs decrease. That gets mitigated because we didn't pay all this money for the generation unit. We have a contract. We're sharing and splitting that risk. Natural gas prices increase. Again, we're sharing that risk, so um, we're able to mitigate that. Um, performance risk, I think this is probably one of the most important ones. If we ran the units on our own, we would be liable to have to make sure that we turned them on at the right time. In this instance, we'd have a contractual relationship with someone, and if they didn't turn them on on the, on the hottest day of the year or they goofed up and didn't, um, uh, didn't uh, get the sink reserve revenues, they would be on the hook for that penalty. And then there's always regulatory risk, whether we own this or have a third-party arrangement between the federal regulations, FERC, New Jersey, PJM, and alike. Um, other short concerns, which I've already mentioned, the neighbors. Um, these are going to be sound attenuated units. We would want to talk to them beforehand, make sure they fully understand what it is. And, and the fact that, it, in my opinion, it's possible and maybe as a benefit to the neighborhood that lives in the area, you say your area will be energized if there's a long-term outage. So we understand you might not be thrilled having this generation unit there. Really, it's going to be no noise compared to backing up a, a truck and the, the, the noise of that backup alarm. But um, that's something the council could offer. And then the legal issues, um, once we issue an RFP, um, we'll do a more detailed contractual scrub with our, with our um, legal staff. I know I'm talking fast. Jim, can I talk for one second? Quick, quick thing on the noise. I assume Seaside Heights, which with its development, those generators need to be close to residents or, and or businesses. that They're not off on their own anywhere. So. Yeah, the, I mean, the other thing about them is they're diesel, and, and they're noisier than gas ones. And I believe, I'm trying to remember, I think nearest residents were maybe a quarter of a block away. I would say from the finance department to the construction department. Yeah, I think that's about right. 
and they didn't complain. And then when they ran them, when you know, and caught the town up and running faster, they all applauded. Mm -hmm. Jim Aubin and Pat. Yeah, Jim, you mentioned that some other municipalities do this already, and these numbers look very promising. But I'm not even going to comment on them yet because I know we need more information. Would it be possible to get some of the financial performance numbers from these other municipalities? Let's say like a Seaside Heights. If, or what was the other one that you mentioned? So um, Sussex Rural does it a little bit different. They, mm -hmm. actually have a, they actually have a division that builds generation and will go out. So for example, they partnered with a Mountain Creek to build a generation unit that generates electricity for Mountain Creek and reduces yeah. their electric costs, but then also they can dispatch and reduce the entire Sussex Rural's capacity yeah. costs. So a little bit different model there. I think this we would be one of the first that did this type of structure, okay. like the Vineland contractual structure with the generation unit. Mm -hmm. But I can get from Seaside, hey, you, you, even better, you guys had the risk of owning these things. How much did you make in the sink right. reserve market? How much did you save in capacity? What are your general overall thoughts? And yeah, I'd like to see to that. that. Okay. That's a good point. Pat? Yeah, so there were two other risks, I think, that we had gotten information about. One was environmental change or environmental law changing. So I think we need to make sure we're protected against that. And the other was just the pure financial risk. And I think Morris County saw this when they did their solar deal, that whoever we contract with that we're we're rock solid certain that they're going to be able to follow through on this and we're not going to be on the hook so we have to figure out how we make sure that so a couple things a performance that bond that they post that they have to actually build the generation mm -hmm. unit and then if they default we get the unit get the assets so that's how vineland did it um vineland did their um solar when the solar renewable energy credits the srx were 600 and would have gone higher if they could and people came in and said basically we'll build it for free because we know we're going to make so much mm -hmm. so much money we'll give you all the electricity for free and the capacity for free because we're going to make all this money on srx the srx market cr crashed but um the company is still solvent because their other alternative is to go bankrupt and make no money so um so it's just their investors are making a return over a longer period of time okay. well i mean you need to be sure that they don't get so poor that they still own the asset, but they can't maintain it because that's also going to be part of their responsibility, and they're going to have to they're going to have to manage it, right? I mean, I'm assuming they're going to turn it on. Are they going to notify us when they turn it on, or do they just have the ability when PJM says you need to bring a unit online, it just comes online? It's just going to come online. Okay. Yeah. But you know what? Making sure the maintenance is guaranteed <laughs> is important. And the other, there's one other thing I noted in here, and they said that to do this, we have to be able to fully disconnect ourselves from JCPNL at times. Is that, in a, is that in a legal brief? Yeah. Okay, that's... that's um, it says switches to be installed to ensure that in times when JCPNL system is down, such as during Sandy, no power or energy may be uh, may inadvertently flow onto their system. Correct. So, so we just need to make sure... That's the islanding that Michael would yeah. create, because the last thing you'd want to... Rob will tell you, he's an electrical engineer. The last thing you want to do is have the electricity backfeed into an area you don't know, and a lineman get hurt or it end up yep. going upstream to the substation. Um, you know, real important to know, but a little tidbit, all the solar that we have installed in town has to have that as well, your individual solar house, because if, if the power goes down on your block... Mm -hmm. And you have, uh, and you're on um, Hunter, and, and Andy Bennett's got his house there, and he's on solar, and the power goes down. Michael's got to go and make sure, hey, disconnect that solar before you start working on it. Mm -hmm. Just because you think the power shut off the bottom of the street, solar can be backfed from Andy's right to the right back onto the wires. So that's pretty much it. This is just a, a kind of a project summary. I think that this. Um, Deal structure offers much less risk for the borough, and um, uh, I, I think it's worth taking the next step. So we're just asking for a consensus to say, you know what, this makes sense to go to RFP, see what we get. Maybe we don't get nearly what we think we're going to get, and it's not worth it. Um, or maybe we get deals that are even better than we think. Bob? Yeah, there's just one other piece that I want to mention there. We talk about um, the benefits to the borough financially. You know, we're trying to attract businesses downtown. We want corporate parks in here. We want our businesses. What a wonderful way to advertise one of the benefits of moving to this town that we have self-generation. That in a storm, that we could actually power up Main Street and possibly the corporate parks. I think that is a huge benefit 
Because I can remember during Sandy seeing the power lines down along the train tracks knowing that we were sunk until J.C. Peel and got, got them back hooked up again. I think that's something which has to be factored in here, the economic benefits to the merchants and to the corporations in town. Comments or Carmel? You know, I want, I, I'm going to pontificate. I'm sorry. But, I, you know, I was thinking about this when I, I read all of this. And, of course, you know, um, being on utility advisory committee and talking with Mike, um, I, I saw a great deal of hope for self-generation. And it kind of got me to thinking about, um, you know, the people who sat here before us. You know, the mayor and the councils who sat before us, you know, and you think about like in 1891, we had electric lights in the commercial district, you know, and we had a water and a light department. And th those people had great foresight. And, you know, I mean, uh, listen, there were tracks on the ground, and now we have this beautiful train station. So the people that came before us actually. Um, had great foresight in seeing what needed to be done for the future. Um, I'm thrilled just with handhelds at this point. I'll, I'll tell you, that, that's a remarkable step. So we need to move into the 21st century, and I think that we as council, mayor and council, have to make a commitment to what's going to come after us and, and take that same strength that all of these people had before us to develop all of these great things in town. So when you think about it, I mean, it's like absolutely amazing. Way, way back in 1800s, they had enough sense to build a water and a light uh, department. And, you know, and now we have, you know, something that gives us great income and whatever. So um, I'm in absolute favor of this. Absolute favor. So, but I, I wanted to bring up that point because I think it's important that we have to continually move forward and, and take these little bit of chances and find out what it's going to cost us. So. Right now we are... Um, okay, sorry. I'll say Carmelo just triggered one more thing I wanted to say since we're talking about both meters and this. Um, you know, we talked about peak shaving. I think I'm not as satisfied just doing handhelds. I really like to see automated meters where we can do time of year, time of day pricing because I think more importantly than being able to do peak shaving through adding capacity is to do peak shaving by driving usage down at the most hottest times of the year or the, or the most expensive times of the year. I think it would be better both from a financial perspective and also from an environmental perspective. So I will continue to push for the rapid deployment of smart meters. Thank you. Jim? I just want the clerk to put on the record that I'm going to say this, Hi, Liz. Um, that this is complicated. And this took me a little while to get my mind wrapped around, mm. so I wanted to put it in writing. I wanted to get it out to utility advisory, smart people like Mike Soriano and Alan Sawyer and others, and all of them looking at it. I want you guys to look at it. It took me a number of, wait a minute, sink reserve? Explain that to me. How does that work? Wait a minute. Look, so I, I, I'm telling you, it's... It, it is a bit overwhelming, but we now have it on paper, written down. I'm happy to answer any questions, and uh, we're going to move cautiously forward with this um, and not make any determinations. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'm not going to support saying yes to it until I feel like everyone understands what we're doing. Rob? Well, my only comment is it seems like uh, a break-even proposition for our partner, which, which makes me beg to ask why they want to do it. So um, I said 1.4 million. Say we get 200 to 400 thousand dollars. They get about a million. You said four to five in your yeah, presentation. Okay. They get they get a million, maybe a little more every year. If they get if they get 15 million, and it costs them, and 10 million is total all in. So there's development costs and um, engineering costs and things like that. And so the companies that may actually do this are the companies that would do the engineering work. Mm -hmm. And the companies that would do this um, would also um, be involved in um, the maintenance and the dispatch, and they have services, so they kind of get a built-in service contract. I'm going to be the one that has the software that maintains and dispatches this. And are we going to have to pay for that? No, no, that's embedded in the cost, so they would be they would be paying for it, but it would be paid for out of the savings. But that that doesn't change the million bucks. If they're going to make a million dollars a year, inclusive of the 
of the um, well, there's of the service there's, so cost or not. I mean, so they cost ten bucks to make, and they're gonna make a buck a year, maybe. They're gonna We're talking about a, at least a ten year break break even with a fifteen year cap. They're gonna make a million dollars a year plus the two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of costs that are embedded in there that you're not seeing. The million one point four million is net. So um, it's really bringing in, you know, there's the cost of uh, natural gas, there's the cost of um, the dispatching services, cost of maintenance, all those things are embedded. The two hundred two hundred fifty thousand dollars So they're taking a, they would take a spread on the natural gas? No, no. But, there, but the, there's various costs that I'm saying that are not, the $1.4 million is net. So uh, there's a gross number, and part of the gross they'll be getting in that management fee for doing And you'll show us the gross and net numbers? Yeah, I can give you a spreadsheet. It's, Thank you. I right, do that to you I'll guys yeah. At my office. Yeah, you just, we're, when you start talking about maintenance, some of the other things, we need to make sure that we're not stuck with some sort of Hollywood accounting where we put the unit in, and at the end of the day, we end up with nothing because they add in all these costs to run it, and they keep subtracting to the point where the profitability goes down to almost zero. Uh, and they're making all the money, we're providing the land. We're getting some maybe better reliability, but we're getting nothing else. I mean, we need some levels of guarantee um, on a lot of these things. So we're going to have to take a really hard look at those things. Yeah. What we've been told is fixed guarantee of, da of X plus okay. benefit on the upside. So with you looking for a consensus, just to confirm that, um, what we'll do is we'll entertain a motion to move forward with with a R, the RFP process, and we'll go ahead and recognizing that is not obligating the borough to anything. We're just find, basically finding what what's out there. May I have a motion? I'll move it. Uh, <laughs> Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Quick enough. <laughs> all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. They said it all. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, James. And oh, energy audits. Energy audits. Stay right here if that's okay, Mayor. Yes, stay right there. So Betsy and Steve have really been, you know, strong advocates for this program for a number of years. And uh, we've seen enough towns do it that um, we, we think it uh, has enough merit to bring to council. Um, as explained in the documentation that you received, I'll explain it quickly for the audience. Um, the concept is to issue an RFP for an energy audit service company. And the borough would identify, through this RFP process, the borough would identify a single approved contractor to perform energy audits in the borough. There's no cost to the borough for this program. Um, the RFP simply enables the borough to negotiate a price and quality of work on behalf of the residents and make the process simpler for residents. That company would then come in and say, We've been selected by the borough. You can use us or you can use another company. We'll come into your house for X amount. We'll do an energy audit and, um, and give you suggestions on how to improve the efficiencies. Um, in talking to the company, they hope they can get energy audits from 100 residential units. We're not talking a huge market penetration, but, but fairly significant. <laughs> from there, um, council should realize that the company is going to say, we think you should um, install insulation, we think you should install windows, and by the way, we can do that. Um, we want to make sure that if we move forward with this, the residents realize you're not obligated to use that company. You can, you can use Joe Palawasta, you can use Blaze, you can use whoever you want to, to do your um, renovations. <laughs> but, um, but it is a program that um, now that we've kind of seen it in other towns, it's been pretty successful. Um, Summit, Highland Park, Milburn, um, other local towns have done it. So um, we'd pick the company. The company would put out marketing material. No obligation for anyone to do anything, but it, it, it's good for the environment. This is, this is really being driven through the Sustainable Jersey program, um, and, uh, and so um, we'd get points for it. Um, some of the issues um, I've talked about um, in terms of the, letting the residents know that we're not endorsing this company that um, we're just saying, here's a company that can do energy services for you. And then secondly, um, some of the residents, uh, or the residents in town may not be able to get all of the benefits that you could in Milburn or Summit because of the societal benefits charge that the BPU charges us not paying into it. So you might not be able to replace your dryer through the Energy Star program or something like that. But as long as um, 
you know, all the natural gas savings, all the insulation savings, all the HVAC savings can all can all be um, uh, can all be gleaned, and um, this company will help the residents find the rebates, and find the the available grant funds and um, subsidies. And yeah, ju uh, just a note of caution on a personal experience uh, w uh, during one of our uh, fairs. We had the environmental fairs. I had a long discussion with a fellow who represented a company that does this sort of thing, and I invited him to my home, and uh, it never materialized. And I, I don't know what happened, but I never heard back. And, and I, I understand my experience was not unusual. A lot, the barriers to entry in this business aren't much, so you get a lot of fly-by-night operations, as it were, and um, all I'm saying, by note of caution is that we need to carefully vet a company before we say it's okay for our citizens to have them do audits. The RFP actually talks about that they can only be companies that are approved by the BPU through their, on, and on their website already, on their, on their um, New Thank Jersey you. Energy website. So there is some of that, but you're right. You need to be careful. And that's the downside. I think you know, I'd ask Jim and Ray to take a look at this sitting on the Environmental Commission. Um, it was something they had brought up last year. I think they've been trying to do it for a while. And I think we brought in a company to, to kind of walk us through it. And the key thing for us was making sure that we vetted them, that other towns had had a good experience, and also that from a legal perspective, we didn't feel like we were creating any um, risk for the borough financially uh, backing this group. And I think if we left it up to people to do it individually, it would almost never happen. But by kind of presenting them with an opportunity from one company that was willing to market to the whole town, um, even if they only pulled in 100 people, again, it, it does help drive down mm -hmm. uh, energy usage, and I think it's a good thing. And it also helps us with our sustainability uh, application to the state. No, no question about the benefits. That's yeah. what attracted yeah. me to it. Yeah. But I think in this case, we, think we, we found a couple of people who, were, who had followed through in other places, so we felt yeah. better about them doing it here. Yeah, it sounds like we have the checks and balances that are needed. Let's do, if we're good with this, same thing, a um, motion to move forward with a, the RFP for energy audits. So I'll move that. Second. For the discussion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you, Jim. All right, will the uh, clerk please read the statement for ordinances that are up for hearing? Ordinances scheduled for hearing were introduced by title and passed on the first uh, reading at the regular meeting of council held on May 23rd, 2016. All were posted and filed according to law, and copies were made available to the general public requesting seeing. I call up ordinances for second reading. I ask the clerk to read said ordinances by title. Ordinance 45, 2016, Ordinance of the Borough of Madison, amending Chapter 195 of the Borough Code Land Development Ordinance regarding changes in building occupancy and use. I open the hearing. Anyone wishing to comment, please step forward. Seeing none, I close the hearing. Mayor, I move Ordinance 45-2016. Second. Any council discussion? Roll call vote. Mr. Catalanello? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Wolkowitz? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. I declare Ordinance 45-2016 adopted and finally passed. And I ask the clerk to publish notice there of a newspaper and file the ordinance accordance with the law. Ordinance 46-2016, Ordinance of the Borough of Madison authorizing capital reserve of $300,000 for the Madison Electric Utility Substation. I open the hearing for Ordinance 46. Mike, please step forward. As you come up, please state your name, your address, write the same on the... Paper, and uh, please try to keep your comments to three minutes or less. Uh, Mike Soriano, 230 Woodland Road. Um, I just want to state my support of, for this uh, ordinance and just take a second to uh, remind everyone the process that we went through. It was over two years ago that uh, the strategic planning process began. It began with committees for capital to find out what the borough needs for its capital over a number of years. It uh, included the uh, utility committee, which looked at the electric and water uh, capital uh, requirements. And then to refine that, went outside to get two consultants to come in and refine those numbers for electric and water even more. The output of that was actually 
they were quite simple, if you will. It was the content and the work uh, behind it that was complicated. But it's basically a spreadsheet showing all the projects uh, coming down and across all the years. And then what happened is at the end of the time for the borough, the electric, and the water, you added up all of the uh, annual uh, capital costs that were projected, divided by the number of years, and you came up with a average annual capital cost for the borough, for the electric, and for the water. Hmm. For the borough, uh, that was mainly wars, uh, roads, storm sores, sanitary sores, and that averaged out to about $4 million a year. Uh, for the electric utility, it included the substation refurbishing, which is in this uh, ordinance, and it also included the underground distribution system, and it also included major costs like uh, uh, cable fears. For the water, uh, and that was about, excuse me, for the electric was about $700,000 a year in average annual cost. For the water utility, uh, that uh, included uh, the mains, the well redevelopment that we were uh, talking about, and other projects which averaged $500,000 a year. Uh, what I believe, and I support the process by which you reserve for these, and each year in the annual budget, you would say, on average, put in $4 million for capital for the borough, $700,000 for the electric utility, maybe $500,000 for the water utility. You even it out. In the past, uh, you had peaks and valleys in what you were spending on capital. And I think by even, evening it out, uh, the residents of the town, the council, sees what it really costs to run this borough on a continuous basis, on an ongoing basis, to maintain the infrastructure. And what you also uh, do uh, is you have more discipline, in, I think, in your uh, process of uh, budgeting each year. Now, there's always going to be non-recurring uh, projects that you have. A non-recurring one, historically, has been the fire and police safety complex, uh, including the new recreation fields. Maybe in the future, let's say you decide to put in a, a new water tank. Those are non-recurring, and I think those should be bonded for, uh, borrowed, and spread out a, over a number of years. At the May 23rd uh, council meeting, I was surprised to see as much discussion as there was on uh, whether you reserve or whether you borrow. I think this is one of the recurring costs that the borough has, refurbishing electric station, uh, the substations. It happens over a number of years. You don't know exactly what year it's going to happen, but it should be included in the annual capital budget. and but you don't know the year you're going to spend it in. So my overly simplified way of looking at capital budgeting is recurring items to be budgeted for each year and reserved for if you don't actually spend that. Non-recurring items should be uh, bonded. And uh, so again, I just come back and want to support the, uh, the ordinance that's up right now. Thank you, Michael. Jerry, welcome back. We haven't seen you in a while. Uh, Jerry Stevenson, Three Hardsley Drive. Um, I watched the uh, May 23rd council meeting and heard a lot of the discussion that had to do with the concept of should we bond or should we go on an accrual basis. And then I read Councilman Callanello's letter that I probably sent to all of you and that it's posted on the Madison Eagle website. It's been up there since Friday. And uh, there's some very good points that were raised there. And uh, one of them was the fact that the $300,000 that's requested here is kind of an open-ended situation. We don't really know how much money it may cost us in the future as far as replacing those substations, and it seems to be open-ended. It isn't like we're going to do this for 10 years and set aside $3 million. It's kind of, let's start setting aside $300,000 and we'll roll it. And it just likes it sounds as if this thing could go on for 20 years. 
When Jim was presenting here about this concept of cogeneration, this is an example of how technology is constantly changing. We could be sitting here right now saying, well, we need to be setting aside money for what we think we're going to need for a new substation looking on out here, pick a number, seven, eight, nine years. The second point that Councilman Catalanello raised in his letter, which I thought was also very much on the money, was the idea of uh, accountability and the fact that money that has been reserved in the past for dedicated money has suddenly disappeared. And the example quoted, and I remember it vividly, was with that sale of the property on Maple Avenue, a million dollars was set aside on the part of the borough's contribution for the recreation fields. A million was going to be put together by the schools, and a million was coming in <coughs> from the recreation committee. The upshot is probably 2009, 2010, we had a major problem with the budget. We needed money, and suddenly that million dollars disappeared. And so the question is, if it can disappear back then, could the money that's being accrued here disappear again? So right now, the way it's written, I would urge you to vote against it. Uh, the concept may be good, but it needs a lot of strengthening to make this thing more doable. Thank you. Yeah, j just a clarification, the ordinance would encumber the money that, that as a Opposed to the uh, comparison with the turf field funding, there was never an actual step to encumber any money. So th this is this ensures that the money is set aside in that proverbial lockbox. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Tom. You can change ordinance. Tom Bendinger, 20 Rolling Hill Court. Uh, I'm here. Uh, to support uh, the ordinance as a matter of principle. I think the option is pay as you go or literally you fund through debt. They are both options of the same thing. It's just when you are choosing to fund, pay as you go, you're paying in advance. If you use debt, you're paying on a retrospective basis. One of the things that we suggested that people to emphasize is that the debt service that we are spending on a annual basis is to support capital improvements. We suggested that in revising the form of the income statement and the budget form so people clearly understand. It's like debt is not something out over there and capital improvements is over here. They're combined. They are the same items. It's when you choose to fund it. So the big issue is, is I think the people that sit at this table have the option to decide is that the right amount and is it the right period. And those are judgments. And those judgments can be modified on a year-by-year -year basis. But the dedication in the Capital Improvement Fund does literally lock the money up. Uh, the option, I guess, that I would suggest to take a look at when we had the last bond issue, a major portion of that was set aside for the remodeling of Hartley Dodge. You know what happened. We ran out of money. We couldn't do it. So the bonding did not accomplish what we were trying to have it do. Whereas on a pay-as-you-go basis, at least you're trying to say the people that are using the services of whatever the capital asset is are paying to contribute to funding the future. You can say, well, maybe the debt makes it better because the people who are actually going to use the new are going to be paying for it. I think it's your choice of where you're choosing to go. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Seeing none, I close the hearing. I move uh, Ordinance 46-2016. I second it. Council discussion? Ben? Yeah. There, there is, seems to be uh, a misunderstanding about one part of this arrangement uh, that resulted in a request or advice to um, put aside 300000 or a year uh, as part of our capital allocation to the electric utility. And that is that this is not a one-time expense. We have four substations. They are somewhere between 40 and 50 years old. 
They have been worked on and fortunately have stayed in operation that long without enormous expense. You may recall that the um, committee, the, the, the uh, strategic planning committee that dealt with uh, utilities had recommended that we increase our capital allocation to utilities somewhere between 700 and 1.4 million, 700,000 and 1.4 million a year. And part of what they identified was the aged infrastructure of the utility. We felt, we being those who had to present this to the council and make recommendation, that it was too wide a, a band. You know, we, it, we would be hard pressed to ask you to come up with a number that has a $700,000 spread in it and give us the authority to do with what we think makes sense. So instead, what we did was decided to hire an outside consultant who had expertise in, in this area and fortunately was quite familiar with our own uh, electric system because he had worked on our grid and given us advice in the past on it. And so we're acting on his advice. He felt that it would be prudent for us to put aside 300 <clears throat> pardon me, $300,000 a year. But let me say that that's not $300,000 for one year or five years or even seven years. That's $300,000, period. And it could go up as substations go up in cost. Substations these days do not last 40 to 50 years. Ask Mike Piano. He loves our substations. And he will be very sad the day we decommission, start to decommission them. But that's inevitable. And the new ones will not stay in operation for 50 years. So we have four of them. It's kind of easy to count. If you think they have an average life of eight to 10 years, which is what we've been told, they're about, I'm sorry, seven to 10 years. <clears throat> then it seemed like 300 was prudent, and he included in that, it was someone mentioned, some of the other infrastructure that's part of our electric utility. So to the question of, and this was the question posed, is it sufficient for the electric utility to manage itself as a business and put aside 250 to $300,000 a year? And the answer was a resounding no. Two components then took a second look. The current administration of the electric utility who felt that maybe they, could add, they should add a little more and also they were spending out of their operating money what's really capital and then this outside consultant, we aggregated the numbers, 700,000. So if you want to run the electric utility as a business and businesses tend not to issue debt for things they can afford or reserve or depreciate, in effect, what we're doing is we're putting aside money as a depreciation against the replacement of major assets that are the core of our electric utility. So I just wanted to make that clear. This is, there's no guess about this. This is 700000 a year going forward. And unfortunately, like many things in this world, my prediction would be that at some point it goes up. And that's a, as a result of inflation and the cost of the um, in, of replacing portions of the infrastructure of our utilities. Thank you. Other comments? Okay. Full court. Oh, right. Yeah, so my, my concern is that ordinances can be changed. Uh, we changed an ordinance this year on the water uh, utility that Bob, you and I voted for back in 2011. Um, so first of all, uh, you know, I, 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 I get it. You know, I, I think it's, I think it's admirable. I, I think it's a good idea. But it, you know, in a lot of ways, politicians are like bankers. They see piles of cash and they have to do something with it. They just can't leave it alone. And, and you know, I, I mean, given our own history, first with the resolution on the fields and then with the ordinance on the water department, uh, you know, I, I can't imagine that we're going to amass a cash stockpile of three, four, five, six, seven million dollars. Um, you know, and, and it will all be there. Plus, when you look at the way the municipal budgeting works, you know, you could, you know, there are ways to, you know, you can underfund the electric utility capital one year, you know, draw down, and that is a way to draw down on it. I, I just don't think that it's fair or right to ask 
current residents, senior citizens today to pay for something they're not going to use. I'm all in favor of, like, let's do the, let's do the project now. If, if we're all so convinced that, this, that we, we need to put this money aside, let's just speed it up a couple of years. And let's just do it now. Because that's really the only way that we know that the money that's supposedly going to be put aside is actually going to be used for the purpose that it's intended. You know, uh, the, you know ordinances can be changed, Bob. We, you guys changed one this year. So there's, there's precedent for that. So uh, it's not, we're not, when you encumber the money, it doesn't mean you can't unencumber it. it, it can't, future councils can do all sorts of things that we can have no control over. And I just don't, I don't want to ask my, my neighbors to put money in, into a fund which has the best intentions. It's the right way to do it, right? It's like putting tires on your car we talked about last time, but that some guy eight, nine, ten years from now can decide to, to do, you know, to do something entirely different with. So there's no guarantee, and I, and I just don't think the municipality should run like that. We're not a business, unfortunately. Yeah, the, one, the one thing it does do is it forces that future council to have a discussion and have a vote. So. Uh, it, it's, it's, right, but it's, it's, it, didn't, it didn't stop didn't stop us this year from right, changing something right. we did in 2011. And, 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 so there's no right. it didn't and, stop the Congress but, from raiding the Social Security trust fund. Yeah. It didn't stop the state of New Jersey from not funding the pensions. I mean, politicians do this all the time, all the time. Yeah, I was just making a point that it <coughs> yeah, has to be done in the open, uh, Bob, okay. and then we'll go over to Pat. Uh, well, right now, my head is spinning. Um, I would like to think that. The borough of Madison and its residents are better than some of the foolishness that's going on in Trenton right now. Uh, to say that we're going to start uh, playing games with money, it's a slap in the face not only to the members of this and future councils, but of oh, the I, I, I take exception to that because this council has done it. So please, let's, 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 not, let's not talk about let's slapping let in the face let when me, members of council have done it once and sometimes twice. So let, let, let's, let Bob let's, keep, let's keep the personal let, Let's Bob uh, business, right? finish his comments. Well, no, it's true. Well. It's true. Okay, so let uh, Bob. Okay, please. thank Your you. Your vote stands uh, for itself. Right, Rob, let, let, let Bob finish, please. Yeah. Well, I do take it a little personal, but that aside, I also hear the comments about future residents and, you know, senior citizens. Well, I haven't hit the 65-year mark yet, but I, where am I going? <clears throat> I mean, I'm, I hope to be here, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. So I'm more than willing to put the money aside now, when I can afford it, to pay for these upgrades, to pay for the repairs that down the road they'll be in place. I don't want to get to the point where a substation breaks and all of a sudden we have to go out and bond. Because bonding, no matter which way you look at it, means you're paying more for something than you had to. Bonding is debt. Bottom line, you're going to pay interest on the debt and you're going to be forcing future residents to pay that interest. Don't agree with it, never have, never will. What well, got Madison to where it is today is you it pay you pay as you go. You save up your money, that's the way I run my house, that's the way a lot of businesses run. You, that is not where you, where you want to go. Thank you, Mayor. And then, um, and then yeah. Camilla? I'll, I'll just do the short version of the discussion we had last time, which you generously missed. Um, you know, there, there really is no way to lock the money away as much as we'd like to. Um, the fact of the matter is it'll sit, I guess, in the capital fund, but at any point in time you can simply um, move more surplus over into the general uh, fund and just draw down this amount. We can't lock it away for any specific purpose. Um, if it was me and my personal money, it is my choice whether I want to save for 10 years and then buy something or if I want to borrow the money 10 years from now and use the money today. But this is not my money. This is... Um, ratepayers' monies, and I don't believe that in this particular case, um, this is not what I would call necessarily a recurring expense. I understand what Mike is talking about, and I strongly believe for the the roads, the sewers, the things where we have to keep investing a certain amount of money every year just to keep everything running. It's one thing, but this is um, this is beyond the point where I consider it to be a recurring expense. And I think we're better off. Um, just if if we think we have three hundred thousand dollars extra, I, I gave my recommendations last time. First thing I do is reduce rates. If we don't want to do that, the second thing I do is do a different capital project or add to the capital project list. We have a very extensive capital project list. Mm -hmm. um, and third, I'd advance the meter projects faster and get that done sooner because I think that has more benefit. To put 
$3 million away over the next 10 years, there is an opportunity cost for all the residents who had to give up that money. So yes, it will cost more when you borrow the money 10 years from now, but on the other hand, people over the next 10 years are going to technically not suffer, but they'll, they'll have less money to spend on things they wanted to for whatever period of time. And there are going to be people who live in this town today who eight, nine years from now, two years from now are going to leave town. They'll get zero benefit from providing this money over the next decade. So that's the short version. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Ostry? I, I just want to simply say I think it's a, a, a prudent way to have both savings now and, and the possibility that we will have to go bond you know, in the future. I, I mean, I, I think there are projects that uh, may come up sooner than we think and that this is a, a good, good way to proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Carmel? Uh, you, you know, you brought up senior citizens and, you know, you know, and how difficult it is for them. Well, let me tell you something. You might not have noticed, but I'm a senior citizen, okay? Get out of my here. Kids have not, my kids have not been in this school system for a very long time. But guess what? Do I support the uh, budgets? Absolutely. You know why? Because it makes us a better town. Senior citizens that are living here in this town right now and people who are living here without mortgages or whatever, okay, live here because they want to. They have great services. They came before us. I, I, I just talked a little bit ago about the mayor and the councils who came before us, who made these kind of commitments and made decisions, um, you know, to bring us forward. I personally have no problem with paying my, por my portion of the school taxes because, guess what? I live in a great town. Um, you know, uh, my house is worth a lot more money than when I bought it, very seriously, which is, like, absolutely great. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't understand why we're, why we're just like settling in here. Uh, in the 1990s, when other councils sat here, all we heard, and you can, is pay as you go, pay as you go. And we, us people, that were referred to a little while ago, we're, uh, you know, all we want to do is like, uh, you know, spend and bond. Okay, but now we have reached a point, and you talked about ordinances, and I'm not picking on you, but I'm, I'm just bringing out these conversations. You're talking about ordinances that have changed over the last couple of years. I like to think it's because we probably all got a lot smarter. Okay, we've had a lot more information. We have a different administration that has helped us and whatever. So am I afraid? I, I like to listen to uh, the electric, uh, supervisor, Mike Piano, say, as Ben stated, these substations cannot be replaced by anything that is being manufactured today. I mean, if you listen to him and you have conversations with him, you understand that we probably have another 10 years. You know why? Because they're maintained and they're taken care of in the proper way, because these people have pride in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So. You know, we have to help a little bit. I, I think by adding more debt service to this uh, budgets that are coming up is, uh, is just beyond. And, and I, I'm, I'm a great believer anymore. I, I, don't, I don't fix anything until it was broke because that's, that's the way I feel. About I understand. All right? When it breaks, then I call somebody, you know. And I, to spend $3 million on something that is working you know, exquisitely, just doesn't make any sense. So that, that's all. Got uh, Ben and then Rob. Sure. Thank you. Um, with some reluctance, maybe I should dust off my PhD in economics for two minutes and and go back about longer than I'd like to, but go back about 45 years when actually discussions like this were carried on regularly in a more theoretical context. And the discussion at that point in public finance was, do you fund projects as pay as you go, or do you fund projects as pay as you use? And um, many careers were built on that discussion. I mean, that was very, considered a, 
a core issue in equity in, in economic marketplaces. It also relied heavily on some of the assumptions that economists love to make, which is that everyone has all the information they need, everyone's rational, the market drives the decision ad nauseum. What happened after those discussions was in practicality, that whole discussion now has moved. And, and economists will tell you that they're of a mind that if an expense uh, capital or otherwise is recurring, then you should reserve for it and pay as you go. And if it's non-recurring, then you should bond for it. Now, discussions about equity and who pays for what are important. And, and they really are important to the mindset of an economist. In practicality, they're, can't, they're unenforceable. If, for example, uh, you took the, the, the uh, uh, occasion to talk about schools. Fine. I can talk about fields. I gladly paid. I even contributed to the fields. And I have never been on them and in all likelihood will never be on them because my playing days are over and my children don't live here. My children don't go to school here. I, you know, you can just go on and on. And then how do you assess it if you say to someone, well, You've used this for X number of years, but that didn't fully pay for it. And by the way, you can't leave town now and move out of here because you're not finished paying for it. I mean, it gets, it gets into unmanageable situations. So the short of this is, if you want to be a theoretical economist, which at one point I actually didn't want to be, you, you can play this out as an equity issue and indeed reach the conclusion that people who are objecting to this $300,000 allocation are objecting to. If you want to do it in a practical way and do it in a more applied economic sense, which is what the literature seems to be focused on these days, you would adopt this resolution. And I, and I also want to say one other thing. It would be very distressing if indeed we passed this, and I found that two or five years from now, another council came and changed it but they would be doing it at their own jeopardy because they would have a good probability that they would be sitting here at a point in which a quarter of our electric power system went out. And that's a, that's a good constraint on doing stupid things. So w with that, I, I'm in favor of this ordinance. Uh, I've been in favor of it, and I had something to do with the fact that it's a $300,000 number. Um, would I swear to that? No, but I think our consultant was a pretty good guy, and I'm assuming he, he did the right thing. Thank so, you. I'm going to tell a joke now because I'm a finance guy, and we used to joke about economists. Uh, no offense. No, it's all right. But, you know, we could line an economist, every economist in the world up head to toe, and they would still never reach a conclusion. Uh, I'm also Sicilian, so I don't trust anybody. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a non sequitur to compare $300,000 a year reserve that we can't count on actually being used for the purpose, of, the good intentioned purpose, and your school taxes. It's, we might as, you know, it's, we might as well compare red jelly beans to the portrait of Martha Washington. They're irrelevant, okay? What, 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 I, what, what I think we need to, to keep in mind is there is no control over this money. None. Okay? The school budget, there's control over it. The $300,000 we're, we're putting away, okay, we're hoping that people in the future do the right thing. Okay? I would much rather, okay, be certain that the money that we're putting toward, okay, a potential project is used for that project. Okay, and, and like Pat says, and I agree, well, I agree, I, you know, I, I think that the individual is, is a much better decider of how do you spend their money than future governments, than government in general and, 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 and councils in the future, maybe 10 years from now. We don't know what's going to happen. So that's why I'm against this. You know, call me crazy, and I love I love economists. By the way, they're they're good guys. Sorry, right. I didn't take either comment. There you go. <laughs> but <laughs> the website. All right, I, I think we could. Uh, Sidebars.
Yep, I think we're, that's I don't think, I think we're ready to call the vote. Uh, we'll call vote, please. Mr. Caruanello? No. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Wolkowitz? Yes. Mr. Rowe? No. I um, declare Ordinance 46 2016 adopted and finally passed. I ask the clerk to publish notice there of a newspaper and file the ordinance in accordance with the law. Ordinance 47 2016, Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $40,000 from the Water Capital Improvement Fund for the purchase of utility meters, handheld reading devices, and accessories. I open the hearing. Anyone wishing to comment on Ordinance 47, please step forward. Seeing none, I close the hearing. Ben? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank Pardon you. me. Uh, <laughs> I move Back. ordinance 47 2016. And I second it. Council discussion. Roll call vote. Mr. Catalanello? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Wolkowitz? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. I declare Ordinance 47-2016 adopted and finally passed. And I ask the clerk to publish notice there in the newspaper and file the ordinance in accordance with the law. Ordinance 48-2016, Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $40,000 from the Electric Capital Improvement Fund for the purchase of utility meters, handheld reading devices, and accessories. I open the hearing on Ordinance 48-2016. Anyone wishing to comment on this ordinance, please step forward. Seeing none, I close the hearing. I move Ordinance 48-2016. I second that motion. Any council discussion? Roll call vote. Mr. Catalanello? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Wolkowitz? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. I declare Ordinance 48-2016 adopted and finally passed. I ask the clerk to publish notice there of a newspaper and file the ordinance in accordance with the law. And now we're on to second of uh, invitations for discussion. This is when anyone in the public may comment on anything. Please step forward, state your name, your address, and write the same on the, clip, on the clipboard. And please keep your comments three minutes or less. Terry, come on up. Hey, Matt. Hey, Matt. Teresa Giordano, 24 Crestwood Drive. I'm here with a few concerned residents um, in regards to the door, the pit bull that lives at 34 Crestwood. I have a signed petition to have the, the dog removed from its owner. Uh, we live in fear each and every day. Our kids are, live in fear. And my dog personally is terrorized to even walk up the street. I physically have to drive each and every day up, park up on uh, Cedar and walk my dog. He will not go past the house. Um, as you all know, a borough worker was bitten on May 23rd, one of your meter readers. And another gentleman who is here tonight was also bitten on October 31st of 2000. 16, um, 2015, I'm sorry. Uh, he has also attacked two other people, one including myself, and we would like this dog removed from its owner because she cannot handle him. Um, Matt, can, if, can you uh, cover the process that uh, would be followed for? Uh, uh, from my memory, <clears throat> it's been a little while since I've done this. There's, a, there's laws dealing with uh, vicious dogs um, if a dog bites another uh, person, um, they have to be quarantined and reviewed. Um, that's done through animal control. There's a process by which that's done. Um, animal control can e issue, uh, an animal control officer can issue um, summonses to have them come to municipal court. Ultimately, if a dog is deemed vicious, uh, there's a process by which through the court proceedings, the dog can be quarantined and ultimately euthanized. Um, I don't know where this is in the process. I'll be glad to look at it and provide uh, Mr. Cody, Board of Health, and uh, the animal control officer that we utilize uh, with legal guidance. So we'll make sure that uh, tomorrow we will, uh, if they have not been notified so well, far. According to your um, ordinance 15-2005, uh, a vicious dog, a vicious animal, shall mean any animal which at any time without provocation has attacked or shall attack a human being or other domestic pet 
either while upon or off the premises occupied by the person owning, keeping, harboring, or having the custody of or possession of the attacking animal. Vicious animal shall also mean and include any animal which has caused any human being engaged in a lawful activity or occupancy to be fearful for his own safety by chasing or snapping at such person without provocation. This dog has done such. And we live in prison in our own neighborhood. Okay, so, so we'll make sure that uh, proper, proper steps are followed starting. And the police? I don't know. But, but I, honestly, after the October 31st attack, I really don't know. I did see um, Ben go up there once, and he spoke to them as far as I know, but animal control has never been there. So, as far as I know. So we'll make sure that. I called the police on this dog several times for coming off the property, coming at me. And they went and they spoke to her, but there has never been a fine issue. Okay. okay. So we will, we will start that tomorrow, first thing. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Travis Benway, Nine Lindman Place. Um, as she had mentioned, I was the gentleman who was trick or treating with my then four year old daughter um, when I was attacked by this dog. She saw everything the dog biting me, me bleeding, and me screaming. My daughter's scared. I live in fear. I still have nightmares. Um, and now I hear that another gentleman was bit. My question to you is how many more people does this dog have to bite before something is done? So, as stated now, you know this. Um, there is a process. This is the first time we've been made aware of this, and first thing tomorrow, this is a high priority to follow through. Because certainly, the safety of our residents is our our top priority. Sounds good. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Please step forward. Seeing none, I close this part of the meeting. The um, clerk, please read the statement related to introduction of ordinances. The ordinance is scheduled for first reading, have a hearing date set for June 27, 2016. We published in the Madison Eagle, posted on the bulletin board, and made available to members of the public requesting copies. I call up ordinances for first reading and ask the clerk, borough clerk to read said ordinances by title. Ordinance 49, 2016, Ordinance of the Borough of Madison, amending Chapter 195 of the Madison Borough Code entitled Land Development Ordinance on the Borough of Madison regarding the PCD's zero zone to roll the farms. Mayor, I move ordinance 49-2016. A second. Any further council discussion? Roll call vote. Mr. Catalanello? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Wolkowitz? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. <clears throat> ordinance 50. Ordinance 50, 2016, Ordinance of the Borough of Madison, amending Ordinance 2, 2016, appropriating $33,500 from the General Capital Improvement Fund for Envi Environmental Engineering Services at the Hartley Dodge Memorial to increase the appropriation from $33,500 to $73,500. Mr. Mayor, I move Ordinance 50 2016. I second. Any further discussion? Roll call vote. Mr. Catalanello? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Wolkowitz? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. Ordinance 51, 2016. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison amending Section 185-29 of the Borough Code to prohibit parking on a portion of the east side of Highland Avenue during school and sporting events at the Madison Junior School. Uh, Mayor, I um, move Ordinance 51 2016. Second. Council discussion? <clears throat> I guess, could somebody explain what the issue is that's driving the need to prohibit parking? Yeah, this is similar to the Lorraine uh, Avenue issue of um, parking. So, this is a section of Highland that 
horseshoes or hooks around by the junior school, so the parking on the kind of the in interior on that up, uh, upper part has become an issue as far as sight distance, uh, residents being able to pull, pull in and out of their driveways and so on, so I limited it to... So yeah. it's the east side is, I guess, the what you would call the interior curve? Yep, I would call it it. And um, I think the, for the most part on weekend sporting events, I think the on-site parking is probably underutilized, and so mm -hmm. there is certainly ample uh, alternate parking. Are we going to be able to create signs that explain the regulation? Because <laughs> it says during school and sporting events at Madison Junior School. So it's not like Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. It's not, you know. I think it's the yeah. same as Burnett. It's, this is the same as Lorraine. It's the same thing as Burnett. I mean, not Lorraine, but Burnett. Yeah. Well, uh, Burnett is um, an issue because, or it, we, that's solved because the high school is able to tell the kids you can't park there. So that's, you know, and they have the ability to enforce that a variety of different ways. I'm just wondering, you know, when you're talking about sporting events, so soccer, Saturday afternoon, um, if somebody decides to park there, how are you going to explain to people you can't park there for that event? Yeah, it's, I, I don't know if there's an easy way to... Okay. I mean, I, I, don't, I think it's a good idea. I just want to make sure it's enforceable. So, yep. So the residents are in favor of this? Like, yeah, yeah, so yeah, if, they, yes. if they want to have like, some sort of a gathering at their home, uh, when there happens to be a rec soccer game, they're not allowed to, they're going to have to guess the... Park well, I, I guess what they're walk. faced with right now is they can't park there anyway because... There's no... The, there's no parking because the soccer game's going on, so it's, I, th I think I, it's a fair cop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you made your point. <laughs> yeah. uh, makes a lot of sense. And, and you know, I mean, there's an ordinance in this town that says that you're not supposed to park within 50 feet of, of a stop sign. Well, they're right up next to the stop sign. Mm -hmm. Plus the fact there's all that parking in the junior school. Mm -hmm. Walk oh, no, a little no. bit. I don't disagree. I just want to be sure it's enforceable because it's. I've been down there a couple of times. It's a nightmare. Yeah. You don't. You cannot get a car mm -hmm. hardly through. And God forbid if there's uh, some kind of ambulance or a fire truck that has to go down there, somebody's going to get hurt seriously. I think it's one of the bad. things we could uh, ask to be done is the. The leagues that use the junior school is give them some a blurb yeah. that they can send out to the. Uh, those registered so that they, they get the word on it. That's fine. Yeah, as long as we can do that. Like I said, for the high school, it's easy because you go to the principal and the vice principal and they just tell the kids you don't park there, otherwise there's consequences. So it's, it's a yep. simple population. The other people who park there are not a problem. This is going to be people coming from around Madison and possibly out of town even. Yep. And, and hopefully they'll understand that if they're parking for the, a ball game that do not use it during sports. I just want to let oh, that's me. I don't want to let unhappy people at the traffic court saying, well, there's no sign or the sign was vague. Well, as so that's it, know that Joe doesn't like to put signs up. Yep. As uh, Judge uh, Troxel did one time when a, uh, someone contested a, um, a weekend parking ticket on the crest of the train station because at the time the sign was not in a good spot, he did uh, waive the parking ticket, but he said, but now you know. <laughs> and I know you. <laughs> All right, roll call vote, please. Okay. Mr. Cadlamello? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Wolkowitz? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. Okay. Consent agenda resolutions. Will the clerk please read the statement? Consent agenda resolutions will be enacted with a single motion. Any resolution requiring expenditure is supported by a certification of availability of funds. Any resolution requiring discussion will be removed from the consent agenda. All resolutions will be reflected in full in the minutes. Mayor, I move resolution 180-2016 through resolution 196-2016. We have a, um, before discussion, a um, revision on Resolution 184. On paid position. And so the, um, with the first, whereas where the assistant bur bur administrators recommend the appointment of Drew University Civic Scholar Thomas Ensminger as part-time unpaid intern in the administration department, period. So take out the $9 an hour. I second. <laughs> All right, any, other, any discussion on any, any of the others? Okay, roll call vote, please. Mr. Catalanello? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Wolkowitz? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. Just for Louise. All right. 
I'm missing a page here. Um, unfinished. Wait, it's, at the bottom of, it's on the bottom of the consent agenda. Okay. It's down on the bottom. On the teeny tiny. Oh, there we go. Unfinished there, business. There, there. <clears throat> oh, it's all in one line. No wonder. I, I'm trying to that's save saving paper. paper. Very good. <laughs> there is no unfinished business. Approval of vouchers. Okay, public safety, $9,510.37. Health and Public Assistance, $4,786.62. Public Works and Engineering, $170,448.40. Community Affairs, $4,150.47. <clears throat> Finance and Borough Clerk, $405,123.42. Utilities, $317,292.45. Total is $911,311.73. I move the vouchers. Second. Any discussion? Good. Roll call vote. Mr. Catalanello? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitali? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Wolkowitz? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. All right, there is uh, no new business, but I do have to make this one announcement that the elevator is out of service. We apologize for that, but for those that need the elevator, you'll need to uh, use the stairway. So we'll work with them. We'll, we'll, we can give you assistance, Louise. Luckily, gravity is helping you. Yeah. And with that, I move we adjourn. Oh, boy. Is that right? <clears throat> you have a yellow one. I have this one. Okay. Do you want these chairs? Looks a little fine with these chairs. I don't like that chair at all. No, because I'm not big enough to sit. Oh, I didn't know about that. No, I have my legs don't really reach the ground, and my legs are not. It might be the same. <coughs> they don't like the wind. It's my legs. I'm uncomfortable. Oh, it's, I still don't have a kitchen. <laughs>